So just to clarify, we, don't, we actually don't do um, specific recommendations for carbon emissions reductions, which is what I mean when I say mitigation. We have focused on adaptation, but today I'm going to talk about smart adaptation, which is um, that the very clear message is that you have to do both. And as these two paradigms of uh, issue emerge for governance and other um, author authorities, we're looking for ways that those two converge. And I actually believe that there's a new policy paradigm which has yet to fully emerge. And so I'll talk, that's, that's really the point of my talk today. So um, just to go back over the issue and the, the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing, um, CO2 is going to contribute to warming um, for a long time because of the length of time it takes to come out of the atmosphere. Um, current levels of CO2 that we've already released are enough to raise temperatures to their highest levels since the end of the last ice age. So we've got to do both planning for the impacts of those increasing temperatures and other impacts, um, as well as trying to reduce emissions, because if we don't reduce our emissions, we will not be able to adapt to the impacts. They'll simply be too big. We'll be on a red planet, and there won't be, there won't be a lot going on here. So um, adaptation, as defined by the IPCC, is the ability of a social or ecological system to absorb disturbances while retaining the same basic structure and ways of functioning, the capacity for self-organization and the capacity to adapt to stress and change. Um, I think that's true, but I also think that we can't retain the same basic structure and ways of functioning because those are what got us into this mess in the first place, to quote Stan Hardy, or Stan whatever, uh, <laughs> Stan Laurel, sorry. And uh, so we've got to um, really develop a new paradigm in terms of planning, policy, uh, development, all of the things that we do. And as we do it, we have to couple efforts to mitigate the cause of the problem, reduce uh, emissions whilst trying to adapt to the current and anticipated effects of climate change. I believe that if we try and do both of those things at the same time, we'll actually save time and money and possibly lives. So projected changes in climate globally from the CO2 uh, if effects that we already have. Um, uh, pr the projections that IPCC does, if you've read any of IPCC's uh, publications, they're typically extremely cautious and given the kind of hounding that there's been going on in the media in terms of challenges to climate change science, they're getting more and more cautious. The fact is that the emission scenarios we're seeing are much, much higher than the IPCC's conservative estimates. So uh, you can take, I think, um, from that that these things are definitely happening and will continue to happen possibly faster than we've predicted. So less cold days and nights, uh, more hot days and nights, more frequent heat waves, heat extremes, more heavy precipitation events because one of the effects of warming is that more water vapor is taken up into the atmosphere and is then dumped. They were, they're actually discovering now there are these atmospheric rivers of water that are taking enormous quantities of water um, in trajectories across the globe, which are then get just dumped fairly unpredictably. So along with that heavy precipitation event effect, you get very unpredictable um, and extreme heavy precipitation events. Um, the meridional overturning of the circulation of the Atlantic Ocean, I'm not going to go into too much. It's a big, extra complicated issue. Um, but more droughts and more cyclones and more intense cyclones. So just looking around the world, um, climate change is not a future problem. It's happening now. Um, here is the president of the Maldives conducting an underwater parliament session prior to Copenhagen in 2009, asking people to take action. As you probably know, at least one Pacific island is already considering wholesale relocation um, because of the uh, inundation that is going to happen. Uh, crop and livestock failure is already happening, massive droughts in Africa, and uh, predictions are um, that by 2050, um, the hotter conditions and these changing rainfall patterns that I mentioned will make very large amounts of marginal African farmland uh, unviable for uh, agriculture, and that means more migration. And that migration, again, is already happening. There is no UN designation for climate change refugee, so that their refugee camps, which are designed for victims of conflict and oppression, are actually filling up with people who are fleeing um, dying crops, dying livestock, and the kinds of conflict that result from that kind of resultant poverty. Um, so there, there is, there's always dispute over all of these facts, but just to go back to some estimates that have been made, um, we think that the two degree t rise in temperature will place 100 million people directly at risk from coastal flooding by 2100. 
um, and that an estimated 10 million people worldwide have already been dis displaced and uh, unfortunately by 2050 they think there's going to be a, about 350 million people. Uh, developed countries, it's not, a, we're very used to seeing disaster in, in developing countries, but developed countries are suffering really badly. The United Kingdom has had record floods and um, this is infecting, affecting home insurance policies in the UK. In Australia, the drought, the opposite problem. Um, it's an interesting observation that the loss of life can happen in more than one way. It's a shocking statistic, but in 2006, there was a farmer suicide on average every four days as people lost everything. And they could see that this situation is not gonna turn around. Most people think of a drought as a temporary problem. Uh, it's not going away. And uh, they, do, they have had some extreme flooding, but that doesn't unfortunately solve the drought problem. So that has, as you can see, enormous uh, financial impacts, $30 billion uh, of crops in the area that's being affected by drought. Um, and so it's changed the landscape in Australia already. Uh, retreating glaciers, everywhere you look, all over the world, glaciers are retreating. I think there's one that is not retreating, um, but the, principal, the majority of them are. And as those, I'm sure you've read about the danger of the glaciers in the Himalayas disappearing, that means really serious water issues for India and China, two billion people. So what are people doing? There's a lot going on around the world to address these issues. And um, one example of a nationally driven program is the United Kingdom Climate Impacts Program, which is funded by what was called the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and is now the Department of Environment, um, DEEC, Department of Environment and Energy, sorry, Energy and Climate Change, I think. Anyway, they, they're, they're, inter they're moving around how they group things. Um, but UK SIP is probably the gold standard in terms of government top-down driven uh, adaptation initiatives. Um, there, there is a very strong argument that adaptation should be ground up, but UK SIP is an excellent example of how we need top-down uh, energy and leadership behind this issue to make resources available, to raise awareness about the issues, um, and to really get action going. Because while you have piecemeal, small on the ground efforts happening, um, it often takes people a lot longer. They can't share tools nearly as easily. So UK SIP is a, is a great example of how we would benefit from um, a bit more top-down adaptation leadership. Um, the, as an international start is based in Washington, D.C. They work on adaptation um, throughout the developing world in, uh, I think, pretty much every country in the developing world. And that's very much based on uh, uh, education and awareness and um, helping people understand what's happening in language and, and uh, approaches like drama, role-playing and drumming that people can understand. Uh, Australia has responded through the Murray-Darling Basin Commission. Um, and is trying to uh, trying a number of different initiatives to try and keep uh, the water-related issues under control. So what are we going to see in Canada? And, I mean, this isn't what we're going to see. We're already seeing this. So extreme weather here, um, increased severity and frequency of heat waves, wildfires, rainfall, ice, windstorms. And these all have impacts on infrastructure, transportation, human health. Uh, water shortages ongoing and, and during extended droughts, so obviously impacting the agricultural sector, the energy sector, tourism, uh, our human settlements and ecosystems. Changes in the cryosphere, which is anything that's frozen, um, this is already having a big impact up north, as many of you know, I'm sure. Um, and I include uh, mental health here in this list because uh, the cultural impacts that uh, the Arctic melting is having on, on Inuit communities are very, very severe. Um, and I think that we underestimate the psychological impacts of climate change, um, and, and that's a whole other topic as well. Um, so, obviously, there, there are many impacts of the uh, melting ice. One of them here in BC is hydro, but I'll get into that in a minute, because I'm going to do a BC-specific picture for you. Um, then the disease, pest, and invasive species migration. Um, obviously, you've seen things like the pine beetle, um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute as well. Coastline and shoreline erosion due to sea level rise. The problem with sea level rise is that it combines with the extreme weather at the top there um, to create storm surges, which mean that even a tiny bit of sea level rise actually goes a long way. Um, so we've got uh, one meter, 1.2 meters, I think, projected by the end of the century. Um, and uh, in projections and models that people have done, one meter is as bad as four meters, basically. So four meters would inundate more of the land immediately, but one meter plus storm surge, 
carries it as far in as four meters will go. So one meter is enough to worry about. Climate refugees, we do occasionally see boatloads of people getting dumped off on islands near our shores. Um, I think that we'll see more crises of that kind and more people trying to get asylum. It's already happening big time in Lampedusa in Italy where people are fleeing from the Middle East. And uh, some people think that a lot of these Middle Eastern uprisings were actually caused by some of the climate changes that are happening and the resultant poverty and, and changes in community uh, viability. Okay, so in BC, what's happened during the 20th century already? Um, we've warmed by 0.6 degrees C at the coast, 1.1 in the interior, 1.7 in the north. Uh, minimum temperatures have increased. All of these things are predicted by the, um, the, those general predictions that I showed you earlier. One benefit is growing degree days um, have increased by 5 to 13%. This doesn't say it here, but there's a downside also, which is that the seasons keep happening at different times, however. So you'll get the trees budding much too early because it's warm, and then there's a massive downfall. All the, all the uh, blossoms get washed off, and then they don't fruit because they haven't had time to pollinate. So there's, it, it could be a benefit, and I, I don't want to ignore the opportunities that go along with this. Uh, precipitation has increased. Sea surface temperature has increased. Snow depth and snow water content have decreased in some parts of BC, obviously not Whistler this year, but uh, you know, we, we tend to get hung up on what's happening this year, but you've got to look at the overall trend. And uh, lakes and rivers throughout BC became free of ice earlier in the spring, up to 93, and I, that needs updating, obviously, but I think that is, uh, there's definitely major issues with water temperature. So um, the costs of these impacts, um, just to look at some of the impacts in terms of the ice storm, 28 deaths, 900 injuries, $5.4 billion in costs. Um, similar uh, costs of, in terms of life and uh, property um, in southern Quebec, tornado, extreme, uh, we all remember the extreme storm in 2006, which caused a boil water advisory for a record 2 million people. So again, endangering human health, costing us a lot of money, and uh, generally inconveniencing people. This is a big deal, really, in Canada because most of our physical infrastructure is reaching the end of its shelf life. And very often, the federal government, for instance, has been shoveling a lot of money into infrastructure but has not been requiring that new building standards be taken into account despite the fact that it's increasingly obvious that historical standards are becoming obsolete. So this is what you call a loss of stationarity. Over time, humans have, have established a coping range. We know what the extremes are, and that's what engineers base their... Uh, baselines on, we are now going way outside what you call that stationarity level. And so our standards just aren't going to be relevant anymore. And we've really got to think about that. Um, we're also vulnerable because so many of us live in urban areas now. Um, this has last century was the century of urbanization. And uh, that means that a small problem with, increase, with extreme weather causes a major amount of damage because we're so concentrated. And the interdependence of our infrastructure systems uh, raises the potential for complex failures and puts you know, more people like, say, seniors who might be cut off at risk and that kind of thing. Um, the first National Engineering Vulnerability Assessment of Public Infrastructure, which was um, undertaken by Engineers Canada and other organizations, um, showed that our water systems are vulnerable to heavy precipitation events and drought. Our power supply systems are vulnerable, and most of our buildings are vulnerable. So one adaptive conclusion at the bottom there is that we need decentralized, resilient energy systems. We need new building standards. We need improved emergency measures and communications infrastructure. So those are all extreme weather-related, um, drought and fire. Um, the massive impact of the uh, prairie drought in 2002 cost the whole economy over $5 billion. Um, the BC wildfires, obviously, are very inconvenienced, inconvenienced people, cost a lot of money. And then, you know, it's just getting worse, basically. The 2009 BC wildfire season, um, not only did we have a record 85% of the province facing a higher extreme fire hazard level, but we broke two records two days in a row in terms of high temperatures, 34 degrees on one day, followed by 34.4 the following day. So now I'll talk about the cryosphere impact a little bit. Um, to, to give you a, a very 
specific on the ground example, Pangnatung in Nunavut is a very small little hamlet, a uh, long way from anywhere. Um, Public Safety Canada actually thought they were going to have to fly out the entire community because um, it is built on permafrost, the permafrost is melting, the glacier is running off underneath in what they think are old glacier drainage channels, and because it's running off so much faster and the permafrost is melting, massive cracks started to show up. Um, the people there were completely cut off because the bridges were, they have, I think they have two bridges and both were rendered inaccessible. Um, so it hasn't fallen through yet, but they do actually think Pangatung might just fall right through eventually. Um, now our uh, colleagues at UBC, Dr. Stephen Shepard, um, has done some amazing work on visualizations. And I think he's really hit on something here because I think, you know, we talk a lot about this stuff. People have what you call climate change fatigue. Yes, there's a lot of problems. You just, you know, everybody's overwhelmed with information, worry, not knowing what to do, etc. So what Stephen's doing is he's actually making these things into pictures for people so they can see it. I think it makes it feel more manageable. It makes it feel more tangible and something, you know, we've really got to do something about this. It's not just ideas or people or data. I mean, these are just ideas. These are, these are visualizations, but I really think it helps and, it, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words, if you like. So this is from now to 2080. He's got a series of these, but I just picked uh, the first one and then the last one just to help you see um, what under the climate scenarios we have, it looks as though uh, our, our snowpack will do um, it, but by 2080. So this has implications for our hydropower, for tourism, for the ecosystems that rely on, on that cryogenic storage and then uh, water uh, supply. Okay, so um, what are the impacts on biodiversity? And again, I've tried to give BC examples here. The mountain pine beetle, which has proliferated due to warmer winters, it used to be killed by the cold. Uh, it now affects 40 million acres of BC plus parts of Alberta. And because of the decaying wood, it will have released 270 megatons of CO2 into the atmosphere uh, from Canadian forests by 2020. So that's a really strong example of how adaptation and mitigation become the same issue, and we must think about them at the same time. Um, salmon fry can only withstand temperatures of up to 18 degrees centigrade. Uh, last year in Port Alberni, the Hoopachasset First Nation are very proactive on their fisheries management. They measured uh, their lake. You can cool streams by... Um, ensuring there's enough greenery to hang over them, um, but you can't cover big lakes. So the big lakes around Port Alberni got very hot, and the water running off them into the streams caused the stream water to reach 25 degrees centigrade. So that's absolutely unmanageable for salmon fry. So during recent warm periods in BC, 50% of Fraser salmon have died during migration. And uh, another example of a of, a, of an opportunistic biodiversity uh, effect is this uh, fungus that you may have heard of, Cryptococcus gattii. It's a potentially fatal tropical fungus. It attacks the lungs. Um, it's caused a major outbreak in BC and affected a Danish tourist. And, and there was actually a travel warning advisory against Vancouver Island, which must be the only one ever in history um, in 2006 by the Danish government because of that. So sea level rise. Um, Sea level rise seems like a distant problem, um, but uh, the, the problem with sea level rise and, is that our infrastructure on the coast, like our ports and our freight terminals, and uh, not to mention people's property and the high-value waterfront property, takes a long time to rebuild. You can't just turn on a dime and quickly change it. So if we're looking 100 years out, which is a good measure for infrastructure, uh, we are expecting 1.2 meters of sea level rise in BC. And I'm sorry this is such low res. These top pictures, I stole them off their website. That's why they don't look very good. Um, <laughs> I didn't have time to get the actual pictures. But if you haven't seen these before, this is more of Stephen Shepard's Delta uh, visualizations. They've worked very long term with Delta, who are very proactive because they know they're, they're probably the most at risk of any of our municipalities to sea level rise. So what this constitutes is four different scenarios. The red one is business as usual. Uh, the top right um, is adaptation with no mitigation. No, no, um, it's adaptation without emissions reduction measures. The bottom left is uh, emissions reduction measures and no adaptation. And I believe the bottom right is both because so, that's why it's a green world. It's like we're doing everything we possibly can. So what he's showing here is that the top left, sea level rise with no action is going to be pretty a major devastation for people who own homes in Delta. Um, top right shows that you could do coastal reinforcement with green, with, that's called a berm, 
and it's one way to reinforce the coastline without it using concrete because we have to be careful not to increase our emissions in our adaptation measures. Um, so bottom left is just, I think, where they've put up uh, solar panels and little windmills, but they haven't done any like preparation for the sea coming in. And I think bottom right shows you could actually build on the berm and, um, and has, you know, so all the best of all worlds. And in fact, when you look at this in, a, um, in the proper resolution, it has people cycling down the street and there's edible gardens and, you know, it's that lovely utopia that we all really, really hope will happen one day. Um, so there's another um, initiative to get people engaged. Um, there's a called the King Tide Photo Initiative, which is being run by Ministry of Environment. They got this idea from Washington, which has been a much more proactive um, state than many. Um, this is Victoria Waterfront. So you don't have a lot of room for sea level rise here. <laughs> I mean, okay, yes, the uh, Empress Hotel is raised up above the thing, but the walkway itself only has about this much to go. Uh, it's not enough. So there will have to be some adaptation there. Um, as of April 6th, which was just last week, the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations in BC released updated BC guidelines for sea dike design and management of coastal flood ha hazard land use. And we're also helping them put together a primer for local governments. And they are basing that on 1.2 meters of sea level rise over 100 years. And the city of Vancouver has now mandated that in a bylaw that every uh, all coastal infrastructure in the city of Vancouver must comply and it isn't just 1.2 meters because you have to add storm surge too. So I believe the actual accommodation for that is something like two or three meters of uh, leeway. So that's happening now. This is, you know, we're doing this. So here's an example. I've mentioned Delta. Um, Delta, probably one of the most forward-looking municipalities we have. Um, they've already, ex I'm not going to go through the impacts of climate change again, but they're experiencing those. Their climate change initiative has two main goals, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from buildings, fleet vehicles, and operations, and to adapt their municipal infrastructure. So um, they have flood management plan, urban forestry plan, building efficiency plan, and infrastructure plan. Um, so they're really trying to do it all. Um, I'm not sure how much those two, the one and the two there, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and the adaptation are communicating with one another, and I'm going to carry on and talk about that because this is a very typical example of how Metro Vancouver, many municipalities have a team working on emissions reduction and a team working on the engineering that means adaptation and they're not talking to each other. And in my opinion, if you're going to have these two major paradigm shifts, you should talk to each other to see what the win-win solutions are. The engineers can help reduce emissions from, you know, so if you're not thinking about the two at the same time, you may do what's called mallet adaptation, where you increase your emissions by doing, say, a lot of concrete reinforcement along the foreshore. That's very high intensity emissions. So anyway, we can talk about that during the discussion period, I hope. BC government is building capacity for climate change adaptation. It's great to see Nastenka here from PIX. Um, and uh, so PIX is, is designed to... Um, promote viable emission reduction and adaptation options, but I still think we have a long way to go, as I said, in bringing those two together in real planning. Um, there's PKIC, which is doing a lot of modeling for us, and they're mainstreaming streaming adaptation into everything from living water smart, forest management, their conservation framework, the mountain pine beetle adaptation plan. And, uh, you know, we don't, there's, there's some action on this at the federal level, but it's also good to see that there's a national approach happening through the Council of the Federation, which is every, all the premiers in Canada um, in one group working with their uh, relevant people within their um, governments to prepare for climate change. And they have a, a water charter, which we'll be working on through this uh, renewed funding that we have. So we need adaptation policy. Um, National Resources Canada did a national assessment in 2007, which shows that all Canadian sectors and the well-being of Canadians are threatened. Um, looking at the insurance industry, which is very alive to this problem, half of every dollar spent in Canada by the insurance industry is on flooding, uh, grey water back up into basements caused by flooding. Um, global insured losses total $45 billion, which was a 50% jump from the previous year in 2008. Some of that is attributable globally to the fact that more and more people are coming into cities, but it isn't all attribu attributable to, to that. Um, so we, to me, this means there's a very clear need for policies that are designed to reduce vulnerability, strengthen capacity to cope with impacts while reducing emissions. And that's what ACT does. We're trying to look for win-win solutions. 
So what are some of the barriers to adaptation for a start? High cost of infrastructure replacement, jurisdictional fragmentation, ministries within governments don't talk to each other and different levels of governments don't talk to each other. So it's, we have a very large number of different departments dealing with, um, say, water, for instance. You've got agriculture, you've got natural resources, you've got environment, you've got tourism, and they, don't, they all have different standards, and it becomes very difficult um, for practitioners um, to actually navigate some of those uh, mazes. Um, so we're really advocating for um, jurisdictional harmonization, so that how do we improve communications mechanisms and um, decision support mechanisms uh, vertically and horizontally in government. Reactive governance, we tend to wait till there's a disaster and then do something. It's a very human uh, way of doing things. Um, it's a shame because I think it um, ignores what I call the adaptive advantage. We're the only species that can predict the future. I mean, that may not be true, actually, but um, it's the only one. <laughs> we're the only ones I know that have climate models. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, if we can actually say, look, this might be a problem, why wouldn't we do something about that? You know, rather than wait and look at the kind of uh, human cost, let alone ecosystem cost, and the other things that happen when you wait for the disasters to happen. But we're in a recession, and, and you know, that, that's another uh, opportunity for discussion. Policy gaps, there just simply hasn't been anything developed a lot of times to deal with the kinds of issues that we're looking at. So we need to develop new policy. And there's gaps in information. If you're a little municipality, you probably don't have access to the data. I'm waiting for downscaled climate models to be available publicly to everybody so you can just click on it and go, what am I going to see here? What do the modelers think we'll see here? Um, and I think that could be a federal initiative. Um, somebody should do that. That would be helpful. So anyway, there's other gaps. So just to quote uh, Karen Becker, who's a nationally renowned water expert at UBC, the trend of passing the buck between orders of government creates an ill-coordinated downshifting of responsibilities, leaving key areas in a policy vacuum, which kind of sums up that whole issue. So um, just to talk a little bit about how we become vulnerable, it's more complicated than just being on a slope, for instance, in a flood. Um, there is your geography, there's your energy infrastructure, the kinds of uh, civic systems that serve you. Then there's sensitivity, so if you have a big cluster of very elderly people or sick people, um, and uh, peop if you have very good systems um, management response, that mitigates your exposure there. And then there's adaptive capacity, which is um, a more abstract concept, but really it means how much people communicate with each other. Um, you know, if you're uh, a very... You know, if, say you're a very wealthy person living in the British properties, you've got a giant mansion, you're actually probably going to be less adaptive than someone living next door to five neighbors they know. So, you know, you might, you, you're probably going to have people running around with a cup of sugar or whatever, but you may be quite isolated in a very large house, you know, where you actually don't know anybody who lives around you. So it's, a, it's an interesting concept when you start to dig into it in more detail. So five key principles of adaptation policy, and I, I've starred these because I think that they all... Um, relate to emissions reduction. So intergovernmental collaboration, we should all be talking about both. Stakeholder engagement, we need to get industry on board. Professionals are one of the key ways to spread this stuff, engineers, architects. Um, they all have a major influence. So one of my best friends is a very successful architect. They build in energy efficiency without, you know, it used to be that you'd add it on and say to the client, well, it's going to cost, you know, an extra this or that to be LEED certified. They don't do that anymore. It's just part of the package. Um, so that's a, they've transformed the landscape by making it part of their practice. So it's very important to keep the practitioners involved and um, aware and get their, also their suggestions because developers, for instance, also don't come to the table at climate change conferences. And so they're not promoting some of the more adaptive or, or energy efficient things like, uh, let's say, electric car plug-ins, but that's because they need... Uh, help with the, from the municipal government to uh, give them more money for parking spaces. I don't know. There's like things that never get discussed, which are actually quite simple solutions to the problem. You've got to get people together. Um, so assessment of current and future risk, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity, the through three aspects of vulnerability I just mentioned. Um, I think those are less... Well, they're less relevant to the emissions side of things until you look for the responses, and that's when you've got to look for emissions and how you can help. Acting strategically means um, 
you know, it's a, it's a lot to go to a municipality that's already struggling with a lot to do and say, now you've got to adapt. So what you've got to look for is times when they're going to revisit their official community plan or things like the modernization of the BC Water Act. There are strategic opportunities to introduce these concepts. But the last one is mainstreaming, which means you don't go to a municipality and say, you've got to adapt. You say, hey, you have an official community plan which includes this emergency planning uh, assessment. Why don't you include climate change as a, as a parameter in that? So you just add it to things that exist. You don't try and um, force people to do a whole bunch of, of new things. So in BC, some of the top needs that we have are knowledge mobilization and outreach. We need to raise awareness and provide resources to people, especially to municipalities because they're on the front lines. So I think you know federal and provincial government have a responsibility to do this, and so do we at universities and, and uh, anybody that can help, really. Um, new data and tools. Um, we always need new information, and uh, um, uh, we can adapt things that already exist. And um, we need to think locally and globally, as I've said. It is a locally driven concept, but it really requires support from higher levels of government. Um, we need to build expertise. People talk about sustainability. It's becoming a problematic word because being a sustainability professional doesn't mean you know anything about building resilience. Uh, or, by, or, or, you know, it, you, so we've got to actually uh, foster career development and training for people who, who really know about these issues and who can help, um, help address them, as well as uh, capitalizing on the potential for new job growth. But most importantly, in my view, cheer and steer, because we're all really tired of doom and gloom. I, this hasn't been a particularly cheer and steer <laughs> presentation, I have to admit. But, um, <laughs> but I really believe that this is what I, it's this part of the adaptive advantage. We got ourselves into this mess because we're so smart, okay? We can get ourselves out of it again. So some of the key instruments and tools, as I've mentioned, I'm, I'm gonna just uh, speed up a little bit here because it's already five past one. Okay, so planning is absolutely key. Land use planning can, can uh, you know, really, really reduce a lot of damage and emissions if it's done right. Insurance, the insurers, as I said, are alive to this issue and I think they're gonna get more and more creative with ways to uh, either, uh, to actually stop offering insurance in some cases. I mean, you can't get flood insurance in Canada, but uh, um, there, there are gonna be other kinds of insurance that either get incentivized or get taken away or become more expensive. So we really gotta think about those guys because they need governments to work with them so that they're not, for instance, doing what they do now, which is where they tend to you know, zone in a floodplain, people get flooded out, they get bailed out with disaster financial assistance, which we all pay for. So it's not actually, you know, they're collecting the property taxes the rest of the time. So does that make any sense to everybody? It's starting to look a lot less like it does. And then codes and standards, a very powerful adaptation tool and indeed a tool for reducing emissions. So um, now when I talk about smart adaptation, I'm going back to trying to do both at once. Municipalities are mostly concerned with mitigation, not adaptation. The, the BC government gave some very stringent um, guidelines which said that municipalities had to be carbon neutral by, uh, tell me, 2020 is it? Yeah. And uh, so I don't know if that's still going to happen because I'm seeing some shifts at our leadership level, as I'm sure you all are too. But um, they have typically been saying, look, you know, how can we do anything else? We're trying to become carbon neutral. It's really difficult. We don't know how we're going to do it. So um, that's because it was presented as a separate issue. <laughs> if it hadn't been, they wouldn't be in that position. Um, because meanwhile, they're the ones who have to deal with it when there's a flood. So they, you know, they don't have time to plan for a very costly issue because they're trying to plan for emissions reduction and it would, it's strategic to think about them at the same time. So they've treated the two as separate problems. Both approaches are emerging paradigms with little or no precedent, so there's a lot of room to make really interesting innovations in governance approaches here. Um, so I've given a few examples off the top of my head. Trees are being treated as a carbon sink, so don't put them down by the water where they look pretty. Put them on a slope which might collapse in a heavy precipitation event. Um, making your home more energy efficient with things like double glazed windows actually increases your resilience to rain and wind. And there are other um, ways to, to, to upgrade your home for that, drainage and stuff like that. Um, less asphalt, we've got to think about how we create our cities. Um, Asphalt is very CO2 intensive. The process of laying it is very CO2 intensive. Also, when you cover the ground with asphalt, um, 
it means that uh, when there is a heavy, heavy precipitation event, it creates a flood, it all runs off, the groundwater doesn't get recharged. I haven't even got into groundwater here, but we are sucking the water out of our aquifers at a rate of knots. We don't even know how much is there because we have no groundwater monitoring. Once it's gone, it's gone. You can't just refill an aquifer. And uh, so what's happening is that you get these heavy precipitation events which typically just run off. There's no time for the ground to absorb it. That's made much, much worse by acres of concrete and, per and impermeable surface, which is ten tends to be what we create in, uh, in our cities. So, and I'm, I'd love to hear other examples that you guys might come up with where you're like, wait a second, this relates to that too. Um, and I'm almost done. So, conclusions. I think that's my last slide, yeah. Um, so, low carbon. And this is a very, um, this is a, put connectivity in the wrong place. Uh, this is a short list, but some of the low carbon concepts are smart growth for cities, local food production, <coughs> passive cooling and heating, so you're not cranking up the air conditioning or the heat, renewable energy, electric cars, which are good here, but we've got to remember that most of America is powered by coal, so is electric, are electric cars a good option for, for areas that aren't powered by renewable energy like hydro? Um, Greening of cities cools them down. Connectivity should be an adaptation. Connectivity refers to allow it making corridors for wildlife. Um, and sectoral modifications in the low carbon economy, agriculture is trying to reduce its emissions. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Adaptation, these are the issues for us. Coastal reinforcement, ecosystem support, permeable surfaces, greening, got the same on both sides. Uh, resilient urban, marine communications and energy infrastructure, decentralized power sources the long-term cryospheric challenges, health risks, and then you get into at the bottom, you know, what are the some of the financial mechanisms or, or uh, policy mechanisms like carbon taxation or insurance incentives. Um, so at the bottom, I've got a series of historical pictures. Well, actually, the one on the left is a current one. I took that in the Philippines recently. Um, but that is a homegrown adaptation there. I don't think that's going to work in BC. Um, there's uh, Toronto looking really pretty with uh, lots of uh, lovely stuff in the air. We used to just treat nature as though it was an endless basket of goods. And uh, we've also scraped our trees, uh, which have had, you know, that, that this is a disaster waiting to happen here with the completely shorn hillsides. Um, it's a disaster for the rivers at the bottom of them. It's a disaster for, you know, the, the ecosystems on them. So. Um, We've done a lot of things in the past that aren't going to work for us in the future. So how do we develop a governance approach that thinks holistically about these challenges? And that's a question that I would love to discuss with you. And thank you very much. And if you want to see our reports, they are at uh, this website here. And I've got a few copies of our briefing on climate change adaptation and water governance, which was released in October. Thanks. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> You can take a breath now. <laughs> Questions, remarks? Do I need to use the mic or can I just unmute you and then? Yeah, we're recording you. Deborah, thank you, Shauna Sylvester sure. with Carbon Talks. Um, I uh, thank you. There is so much in that presentation. I couldn't I couldn't keep up with notes. There's just so much detail in there. So thank you for sharing that. Could you go back one slide? for just a sec, just. Um, one of the questions I have, if we're looking at transportation in Vancouver, and we're looking at obviously uh, carbon tox is coming at that from the carbon end, and you've always been really good in saying to us, where's the adaptation? So take me through some of the questions you'd ask, looking at our whole transportation planning for the city of Vancouver. What are the key questions in adaptation? Where's the possibility of the so um, when you say transportation, do you mean public transportation? We're looking at the whole. So if we're working with the city of Vancouver on their transportation plan, the new one, and we're working on an engagement process around that, what are the key questions that we need to ask from an adaptation point of view? Um, well, uh, I mean, I straight away think about emergencies. So if there are, what are the emergency transportation services if there's a... Um, extreme weather event. One of the problems that's happened when, for instance, we've had an extreme snowfall or um, something of that nature is that seniors often get cut off. They can't get to their, they can't, neighbors can't get to them, they can't get to medication. Um, so um, then there's um, extreme heat issues. So if you're going to have um, 
So for public transportation, it, it will be important to have um, air conditioning, but then you've got to get into how do you do that without raising your emissions. Um, so um, there's so extreme heat and uh, extreme weather um, contingency planning. Um, uh, I mean, transportation is a harder one because it's so emissions based. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we need to look at our, our uh, roads in and out of the city to to see if they would be impacted by emergency extreme weather but i mean i think vancouver's pretty good um say the portman bridge i mean they're twinning it so there's going to be i mean that's probably not a good thing but in terms of resilience it actually is a good thing um so maybe if you could give me some more some of the examples of that that you're looking at cause that's a very broad question so yeah it, it Part of what happened is we looked at, uh, at the front end with the city of Vancouver, the, the principles that guided their 1996 plan and then the new bedrock principles that would guide their next one. And it was interesting, resilience became one of the key principles. But then how do you build that into ensuring, I mean, resilience from that vantage point was saying, how do you keep the city alive economically from a green vantage point, from all of those various ways? And so I. I don't know the questions necessarily. I didn't cue in on, let's talk about emergency vehicle access uh -huh. anymore. I mean, I can think of coastal reinforcements. Where are we building our, our, our roads? How are we dealing with our port? I can think of those things, but I'm not, my mind isn't tuned to adaptation in this way, so. Uh -huh. I think I'd like to think about that one a little okay. bit more, because I really want to give you a good answer, but I don't. Okay. I, others, if they have, if there are others here that. I don't have an immediate kind of. Uh, but I could do some research and get back to you on that one, Shauna. Okay. Be, I'd rather do that and take a bit more time to think about it. Okay. Is there somebody back here? <laughs> uh, Malcolm Shield, City of Vancouver, Climate Hi. Programs Engineer. Um, I work on the mitigation side. I'm, I'm no adaptation specialist, but the difficulty that I always see with adaptation is how do we deal with the upfront costs when we work on a three, five, maybe a 10 year financial cycle when we're gonna be reaping the benefits of this in 50 plus years time? How, how, how do we actually get the sales pitch across to get the money fronted up to get the work in place that we need to? Is it purely just an education piece? Is it turning up with better localized models or is there, a, is there an approach outside just convincing people that they don't have a choice in the matter? Um, that's the perennial question. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, it's one of the major barriers is that the high cost of infrastructure replacement. I think one of the emerging arguments, and it, it hasn't been made strongly enough yet, but how much more it's gonna cost if you don't do it. Um, and uh, Insurance Bureau of Canada has just commissioned a study, um, the first of its kind in North America, um, to assess the cost benefit analysis of what will it cost a municipality if they do or don't adapt. In fact, I think they're going to, what they're actually gonna do first is the cost of doing nothing. Um, and I'm going to be bidding on that <laughs> in July. So um, I really think it's important to whoever does it to pick a municipality that will be extrapolatable to the other municipalities in Canada. Um, there are other answers to that question, though, and it, it's too bad that the carbon taxes, I, think, I know they're reconsidering it, but, um, you know, we've been thinking for a long time, how do you pay for this stuff? So one of the ideas was to go to the, um, the c carbon trust and... Uh, you know, make the argument that adaptation um, is so related to the carbon emissions that we should be using some of that money for municipalities um, to do adaptation, things that cost um, in terms of adaptation. Um, uh, then there are also, I mean, if you go into the cost of doing nothing, you can argue that these costs have been displaced, so you can actually, you know, this will actually be better, so you can now reallocate that budget over here. Um, and also maybe phasing. I don't know, like whether whether because you say like a ten-year cycle, you could say, well, look, um, in in you know we're not going to see. For instance, I just talked to Port Metro Vancouver, and they've done a plan to 2050, which doesn't include infrastructure change for climate change, and they may or may not regret that. But they are anything up to to 100 years. They're thinking about it. So you could say, look, look, you've got a ten-year cycle. What is like one pilot study we could do in that time? Well, like. Um, you know, one thing we could do, rather than trying to do, I mean, I, you know, this may not make any sense to you, I don't know what you're dealing with, but I mean, to try and maybe make, I think um, pilot examples are a good way to go, because then you can show the success of it, hopefully. Um, 
and then others can take from that example, the rest of the municipality can take from that example, rather than trying to do the whole thing all at once. Um, and then there are some really basic stuff that little retrofits that, I mean, it depends what kind of initiative you're talking about. I mean, are you talking about coastal? Are you talking about sewer infrastructure? What kind of thing are you yeah, referring I mean, to? Most of your Because I know that they've got a very active group, Tina Neal, right? She's working with Towns and Mills. Um, so I wonder if the province is going to do anything. And does DFO come into anything coastal? Or do they not? Not that I'm aware not, of. Not within the. Not, but yeah. yeah. Anyway, that, but we are going to be producing a primer for you guys so you can like see what the different options are. Because it's not all diking. And uh, so, yeah. We've, I mean, this is like the kind of conversation we're having because it's happening now. Nobody, unless you go to Holland where they've already done a lot of this, but this is it's new, these are new problems. So it's it's exciting to have the opportunity to work together to try and figure out what the answers are. Uh, I'm John Richards. I teach economics here, and not surprisingly, I come at things via price. And I'm also on the gloomy side of this discussion. Uh, it's occupational hazard to think that your occupation is the most important and we economists tend to be <laughs> worse than most in thinking that. Maybe we'll get away without having to do carbon taxation, but I, I keep coming back to that as the only long-term policy change that will make the myriad decisions that we're talking about sufficiently concrete at pun that they might be implemented. Uh, so where, where are we at in terms of accepting the need to reorient a tax system, incorporate uh, some really significant carbon emission pricing? And now, I, I shouldn't really be charging you with this question. I have the answer to it. Because you're, <laughs> because you're on the adaptation side of it. But we're collected well, here. We're really yeah, talking always. to the converted in this, in this discussion this afternoon. And I'm interested in, in, in people's ideas. We made a little bit of progress in British Columbia via, <coughs> and we should, I guess, not be totally gloomy. This is the one jurisdiction in the country that has a semi-respectable beginning of a carbon tax. There's lots to be criticized about it. Uh, fortunately, the NDP did not win the last election, and hopefully, if they do, which is quite likely, win the next election, they'll be a lot more responsible on this theme than they were in 2009. Meanwhile, the provincial government, which deserves credit for having initiated this tax, is now led by someone who pretty clearly is not particularly committed to it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not optimistic in the short run about this. Could, uh, there, there's some very small scale things that, I, that come to mind. You're talking about your architect friend who is prepared to incorporate environmental considerations into his designs. My brother's also an architect, and he got this magnificent project to renovate a very, a very fancy private school in the, in the city, which did all the bells and whistles. But this is because it's an elite institution led by elite people, and they didn't have short-term budget considerations. Virtually all of the attempts to try and persuade people to make architecturally based decisions on long-term environmental considerations fail. The, the, unless people have got something in the order of a 15% rate of return, they don't do it. So I'm interested in, in ideas around the room. How do you make the idea of rejigging on a major way the tax system to incorporate pricing of, of emissions something that's feasible? Mark's going to answer that, right? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was looking at Mark as I was battering away here, and I passed the ball to him. <laughs> well, we all in this room are in a painful situation of you know, knowing that doing the right thing is, is not really a matter of policy or technology. It's a matter of the lack of political will. And I guess that's what uh, I've been struggling with a lot over the past couple of years, particularly watching the situation deteriorate when you know we're we're determined to, to dig ever deeper with more extreme energy projects 
that will put more carbon into the atmosphere and accelerate the cycle. I, I was at a conference and I was sitting next to Pat Carney, former conservative senator, and I asked her, well, what is it? Is it, as a Harper, is he a, a climate denier or is it just that the, the politics and the money and the, you know, the vested interests uh, are just too powerful to over, overcome? She said that he, is, he believes in climate science, um, but is not prepared to do anything until there's an international treaty that has the US and China in it. Which I think makes a certain amount of logical sense, although we are also the ones trying to sell China all of these fossil fuels that are uh, pushing us further down the road. So yeah, I, I don't know, I don't, that's not a, a question. It's more just <laughs> my own kind of feeling of despair watching all of this unfold. Um, so I guess, the, I mean, that to me makes the whole question of adaptation and resilience more pressing. Because even in the next five years, like we know, there's a, I'd say there's a chance in the next five to 10 years that perhaps with another two or three Katrina level disasters that we will that will catalyze global movement on it. That's kind of the only shot we have at. And even then, we know that there's a lot of uh, warming built into the pipeline, um, and we are going to have to to adapt. And I guess one of the questions I think is interesting that you touched on in a few places is around resilience and what that really means. Um, you spoke about uh, resilience as it relates to ecosystems, which I think is really important. Um, and and a concept of resilience that is different from um, just accepting the world as it is right now with a few upgrades and improvements that make us more prepared for another storm. And I think that uh, is a really you know, important uh, piece of this. Because I think we too often, in mitigation and adaptation discussions, get too trapped into this idea that everything has to be kind of the way it is and no one has to be put out you know, because of these policies we're enacting. Um, so I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I will say with, with John's point, I think, you know, the, the, we are facing this overarching challenge where taxes have been so demonized over the past decade plus. Uh, I think we need to rebuild support for taxes and by, t by linking them to actual projects. So when we talk about the stuff we need to do in terms of adaptation, in terms of public transit, in terms of building retrofits, in terms of training workers for green jobs, you know, renewable energy, the whole gamut of them, I think there's a pretty persuasive package that says this is a lot of stuff that's good for the economy, it's going to cost a lot of money, how are we going to pay for it? Carbon tax. Well, and that's the also, only sort of way to go. So. Before you go, I think we should be lobbying, we should be lobbying the federal government to use the subsidies that they're giving to the oil and gas industry perhaps to pay for some of the uh, impacts of that industry because they've reduced, they've, they've yanked all the subsidies to renewables. They're still subsidizing the oil and gas industry, and I can't figure out why. It's not like they're not making money. So anyway, there's a discussion that needs to happen at the federal level, and as for, anyway, I can't say what I was going to say, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think that Obama's failure to um, act has been, has what is, is what has caused the complete failure here. If Obama had gone ahead and, which is what we thought was going to happen, taken leadership on carbon taxation, we would, the whole country would probably have it now. But he, I mean, I'm not, critic, poor Obama, God knows, I wouldn't want to be Obama, but I mean, he had an opportunity, he hasn't done it. Maybe he'll do it in his next term. My, right now he's rushing through the Keystone Pipeline, so I don't think so. So, um, I mean, you know, I didn't even get into the effect of um, the oil, of energy on water and the kind of, the heavy emissions that are coming from the oil sands, which is, meanwhile, I think they've punched a million wells Per, it's, it's something like a million wells a day or something like mind shattering up in, in the north for the, to, to facilitate oil sands development. To use that fresh water, which we are running out of and we don't even know how much of we've got. I mean, we, you know, we have this myth of limitless abundance of water in Canada. It isn't limitless and it's going to change. And we're already seeing massive you know, um, drought impacts and costs. Um, so there's going to come a time when our grandchildren go, you did what with the water? What did you do? Like, and I just don't want to be the person who has to explain that to them. I really, I, and, I, and I don't think any oil CEO does either. So I think they just need more education. I really do. I, I <coughs> I think we have one more question. This will be our last question today. A cheery question, maybe? 
Well, all right, Sharon Stewart. Okay, yeah. I, I, I regret it. it's probably not a question. Just I just wanted you triggered something. I saw a TED talk, um, and it was in, in Victoria actually, on the oil sands. And just look up TED Victoria oil sands, and there's some. It's a tearjerker actually. I mean, yeah. my daughter sent me the link, and she said, "Mom, this is a tearjerker," and it really is. But it, it shows just how. Um, expansive and drastic that, that what's going on there is is but your your point about water you know you you talked about decentralized power as one of the I think it was on the uh -huh. that side yes um, but so <laughs> both sides <laughs> yeah but <laughs> right but there's also um, you know just um, rainwater catchment which would be more like a decentralized water supply as well yeah. and, and um, I don't know. I think uh, people can, on an individual basis, set an example, and um, and we need lots of example setters. I think, and and those are the people with means at first that can afford to internalize their costs, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, I know in in my neighborhood, I put in geothermal. I'm putting in electric car. Cool. I'm going to do solar panel. I've done the whole, you know, just one step at a time as I can afford it. And um, and you know, my goal is to be an example. And you know, the economist that we had here tonight is not here. But you know, people tend to pencil an investment to see, you know, and, and that they do it in today's oil prices. And well, why don't you consider it with two hundred dollars a barrel oil and other kind of um, costs? Why don't we start encouraging people to pencil these contingencies in and then see if it if it works? Yeah. So anyway. Uh, I guess that's my comment. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't a question. Actually, and I could love to get your contact information, just because we're example setting is awesome. And I, I mean, it was like I said about pilot projects. It just takes people to see, oh, well, this person's doing this. I can do that. Like, so I'd love to put that on the blog or something. So people, if you have a card or something, that'd be great. I think awesome. we have one last question. Do we have an extra minute for one last question? Can you make it short? <laughs> I can't promise the answer will be short. Thank you, Michael Alexander. I'm an urbanist. Uh, concentrated living leads to energy and energy efficiency. Yes. Adaptation would suggest that we need to distribute our uh, our systems uh, to decrease their vulnerability. Uh, but doesn't. But if that's if the system is a living system, doesn't that lead to sprawl? Adaptation suggests that we have distributed energy systems. This is what actually uh, keyed this uh, question for me. Um, but that would suggest that we continue using individual heating and, uh, and ventilation systems built into each unit or built into each home. Vancouver is moving to district energy, which concentrates that, and which takes advantage of the efficiencies of that. So doesn't add, how does adaptation, um, it sounds like in some ways adaptation is frustrating efficiency and frustrating uh, uh, some of the things uh, uh, that we're trying, or would do so. Uh, how do we, how, how do we I can ask that very, together. very easily. It, it, unfortunately, my words have not, I haven't expressed myself properly, if that's what you've heard, because we actually, um, absolutely, smart, I mentioned smart growth in the, in the low carbon. That is an adaptation thing, too. So um, definitely not advocating sprawl, definitely advocating denser um, and, and efficient living systems. And when I said distributed, I meant district. So by which I meant instead of having one big central power grid, you have um, some energy um, provision that is specifically located in that area rather than everybody relying on one big central grid because that's what makes you vulnerable. So the two principles that you just mentioned, those should, that if that's not coming across in there, then I need to change my wording because those are principles that we absolutely stand by. I don't think they, I think adaptation and, and mitigation completely support one another in those regards. So thank you for making that point and clarifying that because um, those are two principles that we would actually adhere to. So obviously I need to rework my PowerPoint. Um, I did mention the fact that we become more vulnerable when we're in urban um, cities. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be in them. It means that we need to think about how to offset that, that, uh, that vulnerability. Um, so 
uh, but definitely we need to, to densify and, and do the things that you just mentioned. So um, it, it does mean an increase in vulnerability, but I think we can offset those things by the kind of emergency communications measures we've been talking about, emergency transportation, um, district energy systems. So when I say distributed, does that, that was a, when I, I said distributed meaning district actually, so I should have just said district, hey? That would have made more sense to you? Yeah, okay, because that's, that's a semantics issue, and um, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Is the urban vulnerability to natural disasters or more than that? Say again? Is the urban vulnerability to natural disasters yeah. or more than that? More than that, how? Like, what do you mean more than that? Well, I interpreted what you said as being natural disasters get more people more interested. Yeah. No, that's essentially what I was saying. Yeah, the extreme weather just becomes a bigger danger when we're all clustered together. That was a short question. <laughs> thank you. Okay. And a big thank you to Deborah for coming today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And because we mentioned the oil sands a lot, I'll just bring up that our next Carbon Talks on April 27th is actually with um, an economist. It's too bad John left. <laughs> her name is Robin Allen, and she'll be presenting um, on her report on the economic assessment of the um, Northern Gateway Pipeline. So if any of you are interested in this question, please join us on April 27th. Thank you all again for coming. Um, there's still candy left. <laughs> and have a great day. Thanks, Elodie.